First speaker up is uh, Jane Valentine. She's a senior research staff member. Previous work includes a postdoc in mechanical engineering at the University of Illinois and a data science fellowship in the UK. She received her PhD in biomedical engineering as well as her BS in mathematics and French, both from Carnegie Mellon University. So I want to talk today about a novel biosurveillance concept that we call a human sentinel network. And we did some modeling uh, to evaluate the potential performance for such a network for uh, outbreak onset detection. What I'm talking about today is outbreaks resulting from an anthrax release scenario. We've also done work looking at endemic diseases, um, so influenza. There we go. Okay, so what's the basic problem that we're facing? Well, public health detection of disease outbreaks is slowed by delays in diagnostic testing and reporting. So this affects the speed and the efficacy of public health and law enforcement responses, and that in turn increases morbidity and mortality. It increases the challenges of investigation. So the goal is to move outbreak detection to the left. And we wanna do this with a two-tier system where first you get pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic illness alerting via wearable sensors. Um, and then you follow that up with rapid diagnostic or confirmatory testing. This has been uh, demonstrated in multiple studies. We know that it works on an individual level. The question is, how does that work at a population level? And is it gonna work well enough um, to, you know, to, to be performant? The, the idea here is to, um, to enable faster and more effective public health and law enforcement responses, um, faster treatments and interventions, and even potentially you know, help determine attack locations. So our modeling objective was to characterize the potential performance of such a system at the population level um, through some careful modeling and analysis. So what are the components of this novel biosurveillance system? Well, first we have uh, this sensor network, what we call tier one. So uh, you know, volunteer participants, citizen scientists from the community would be wearing um, wearable sensors. These are COTS devices uh, like a smartwatch or a fitness tracker. Um, and they will you know, pre-symptomatic alerts biological changes like changes in heart rate variability um, or, or you know, SpO2 levels um, say, hey, we think you're getting sick. So then they, or at least some fraction of them, would follow that up with rapid testing. That might be an at-home or mail-in. Your Rite Aid, or it could even be, you know, mobile labs or, you know, specialty um, uh, you know, testing centers that are set up. So all of the kind of testing we've seen throughout, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then all of this information would be uh, immediately transmitted, transmitted and aggregated um, to an online database and dashboard so that it's available for, you know, timely viewing by public health and law enforcement authorities. So let's talk about how we would model such a system for an anthrax outbreak. Um, so the model structure all, all is built on some atmospheric dispersion modeling that's been done, looking at releases of anthrax um, masses in uh, midtown Manhattan. So we have a population of about 1.2 million uh, individuals under the resulting plume. Um, and the idea is that for each of those individuals, we're going to track what happens over time. And uh, we're gonna you know, model what happens to each individual through a series of draws from probability distributions. We can do this because anthrax is a non-transmissible disease. Uh, you don't have to worry about somebody giving it to somebody else the way you would, would with COVID. <coughs> draws you know, go in order, start following the, the diagram at the bottom. Um, you start with the dose that each individual receives. That's derived from this quick plume modeling. So quick is it an atmospheric dispersion modeling system developed by LANL. Um, and we need the dose because both the probability of infection and the timing of symptom onset are strongly dose dependent for anthrax. Uh, we have the, then the question of whether they're instrumented or not. Not everybody in the population is gonna be part of this network. Um, you know, and then we, we pull and, and um, 
pulling from a model that was built on an accidental anthrax release from a bioweapons facility in the Soviet Union, we look at what is that, that sort of dose dependency um, in time to symptom onset um, and probability of infection. Um, from there, if they are part of the human sentinel network, we can model um, whether they receive an alert in response to their infection or whether they receive an alert that is spurious um, or the result of, you know, maybe they have a cold or they have food poisoning. Um, and then following those alerts, the alerts are the, wear, the, the wearable signals, there's the confirmation, which is the testing step. Um, and then everybody always has the option of saying, hey, I'm feeling crummy, I'm going to go to the doctor, I'm going to go to the ER, and I'm actually going to get, um, you know, potentially get diagnosed through that, um, uh, through that uh, mechanism. Um, the human sentinel network alerts that distribution um, was built from some flu challenge uh, study data done by some of our partners. Um, the confirmations uh, distribution was built by, uh, based on the envisioned CONOPS for the system, plus some SME input, um, and medical ascertainment, again, SME input regarding current medical and public health practices. What are some of the, the inputs and assumptions here? So the key inputs are the doses. Again, these are derived from that flu modeling results. We have 24 different scenarios with different release masses. Uh, we have then the human sentinel network component attributes. So what fraction of the population is instrumented? What is the performance of the alerting system? What's your probability of, of alert if you are in fact infected? What's your probability of a non-target alert? Again, that's you have a cold or, or your watch is malfunctioning. Um, and then we have that tier one to tier two test fraction. How many people who get alerts um, are sent for testing? Um, because we want to look at all these different configurations of the system. We did also model various alerting and confirmation delays. You know, we said, well, what if we were overly optimistic in our alert timing? So we put that in, um, but we actually ended up um, um, not relying heavily on that in our analysis. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions in our model, obviously, but some of the key assumptions here are that the pre-symptomatic sensing and alerting that's been studied in influenza and also in COVID-19 is applicable to anthrax infections. Um, we think this is, this is likely true because the, um, the physiological indicators that are picked up, it's not like those are flu-specific symptoms or COVID-specific symptoms. Those are early indications of a generalized immune response. Um, and and uh, inhalation anthrax is another acute respiratory infection. Um, so we expect it would follow sort of that same early response. Uh, uh, a more important assumption here is that the Brookmeyer model, which is that dose dependence model, um, uh, when we extend it to larger doses that we can still trust that model. So that model um, was built, as I said, on an accidental, um, you know, data from an accidental release in the Soviet Union. Some of our uh, scenarios involve much larger doses than were seen in that scenario. Um, so we have to be careful about that. So here are some of the, some, you know, examples of some of the distributions. So what you see on the left um, is for a particular dose, this is a dose of 8,600 spores. So if you breathe in that many spores, um, this is the, the distribution of when you might get sick. Some people will never get sick. The integral of this, dis uh, this distribution is, is uh, not one. Um, and one thing that we did have to do here was uh, truncate it because again, for these very large doses, one of the things that you see is that some fraction of people, this distribution will predict, okay, will you get sick within one minute? And we know that's not a reasonable assumption. Once somebody has gone through that, they will have a date of symptom onset. Um, so given a date of symptom onset, the question is if they're wearing one of these watches, at what time would that watch alert them if it does in fact alert them? So that's what we see on the right here. This is for an individual um, who becomes symptomatic uh, five days after exposure. And you can see, you know, the bulk of the, uh, the bulk of the alerting would happen in the 12 hours prior, um, prior to that. 
Uh, both of these distributions, as I said before, were experimentally derived. Um, so I've talked about sort of that dose response distribution, um, but how do we get the doses? How do you go from this con these concentration profiles over time to an actual dose? Well, what we do at each time step, time step is for uh, whatever you know, census tract an individual in the population is listed as being in, according to this uh, model, um, uh, for each time step, we take the concentration and we convert it to an inhaled mass using the EPA's average daily dose equation. Um, and this is assuming a breathing rate that's for somebody who's alert but inactive, they're standing or sitting much, much as we are in this room now. Um, and then we integrate that over time to calculate the total exposure amount. This is another uh, important assumption here. We're assuming that individuals are not moving around that much during this one hour time period. And then finally, we convert that total inhaled mass to a number of spores so we can use the Brookmeyer model. Um, and there's some additional work to, uh, to rotate and geo-register the data to align with census tracts. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the different scenarios here, what we see when we look at these dose calculations. Uh, so the three figures you see across the top, these are all scenarios that are exactly the same, except that the mass increases from 100 grams on the left um, to 10 kilograms on the right. Um, and the, uh, the heat map there is, uh, is the log of, of, of number of spores. And so what we see is that uh, higher release masses yield more total, expo total, total exposures on the right, but also um, more high dose exposures. That's gonna be more severe cases and a faster rise in, in the pattern of alerts that we see. In contrast, if we look at the two in the center, those are exactly the same scenario, except that the wind speed is five times faster on the bottom. That faster wind speed dissipates the mass more quickly. It means that we actually have more total exposures, but we have fewer high dose exposures we would expect um, more mild cases, and those mild cases are going to show up later. So we will see a slower rise in those human sentinel network alerts. So, you know, just, just based on, on sort of the, the principles that are illustrated here, we can anticipate that there would be distinct spatial and temporal distribution of alerts based on the release characteristics. Um, I know everybody in this room is on board with design of experiments. A lot of people in the modeling and sim community are not on board with design of experiments, um, but we wanted to ensure that we got you know, adequate um, coverage of the parameter space to really um, characterize this potential performance. So we have nine variables in our probabilistic model and you can see them listed here. We do have some additional parameters that we kept fixed but built into the model. So those distribution parameters are all built in. We can adjust our distributions and see how that would um, affect things. We also modeled sensor compliance um, at 100%. So if you're supposed to be wearing your watch, you're wearing your watch. We know that's not a realistic assumption. It's, it's future work, but we have built that in. Um, the alerting distribution delay and the confirmation distribution delay can be added or removed after simulation runs. Those are actually just uh, constant translations. Um, and what we did was it uh, uh, came up with a de-optimal design with 126 unique parameter combinations. We did that in jump. Um, and that was to ensure that a second order polynomial empirical model um, you know, could, could be um, estimated with sufficient, you know, power and confidence in SNR. Um, again, what we're trying to do here is span the operational space sufficiently to characterize that performance and potentially to think of, to start thinking about optimizing performance. And then because this is a stochastic model, we have to repeat things. So we repeated um, everything four times to look at that run-to-run -run variation. <coughs> We didn't just do design of experiments. We also think about how do you evaluate performance? We wanna think about this before we go about doing our experiments. Um, we model three key times for any individual. Um, 
uh, how long does it take to be uh, medically ascertained? <laughs> Go to the doctor, you know, your, your doctor says, hey, actually this looks like anthrax. They do the appropriate tests and you get a diagnosis. Um, and if you're part of the, the human sentinel network, you might also, you know, have alert or confirmation. Not everybody is going to have all of these. Most people, in fact, won't have any of these in the model. Um, but given these for that subset of the population that does show up either through, you know, typical public health surveillance, this new biosurveillance concept, um, how, do we, how do we gauge what's going on? So the two metrics that we came up with um, are answering these key questions. First, how much faster, and hopefully it's faster, is the human sentinel network than current biosurveillance practices? So to do that, um, for something like this, uh, where there's no endemic level of, of anthrax um, going on, you can say, well, how long does it take me to detect one or two or three or four or five cases with each of my two systems? And then what is the difference in that time? Um, the other thing we can look at is uh, looking at those alerts. The alerts are non-specific signals. If your watch goes off, that doesn't say uh, you have inhalation anthrax. That says, we think you're getting sick. But if you saw a huge spike in alerts all of a sudden in the middle of New York City, you would know that something is going on, right? That population level signal, when you aggregate it to the population level, that tells you that there's something of concern. So we also wanted to look at that. How long does it take to figure out that something is going on, even if you don't know what it is? So for this, we look to model the time to alert that has less than X percent probability of being noise based on sort of the, the total pattern of alert states. So for this, we relied on a Poisson process computation. And this answers the question, how quickly after a release um, do we see some sort of warning signal? So before I get into sort of big picture results, I wanted to start with something concrete. So this is an example of outputs for the first five days following the release for a specific scenario. And the simulation details are listed here on the right. Um, so what we see, the coral are those alerts. That's your wearable sensor going off. Um, and you can see they're listed here as false positives. They're false positives from the perspective of anthrax, but they're not necessarily false positives from the perspective of, of disease. Um, that's your colds, you know, your, your flu. Um, your, your watch malfunctioning. Um, and then what we see about 12 hours after release is that um, the people who received very large doses, their immune responses are now strong enough that the watch is picking up on that. And we do see, in fact, this huge spike that is on a log scale, the y-axis, um, so it is quite large. It's uh, about 12 hours after that, that you start getting that confirmatory test results. There are uh, DOD approved rapid tests, rapid blood tests for anthrax. Um, and, and that one is your timing assumptions here. Um, and then it's about a day after that. That's how long it takes for somebody to actually become sick, to go to the doctor. And if you have a particularly astute clinician um, you know, who's, who's really on the ball, maybe you get a, a, a rapid diagnosis. Um, this is for this specific scenario, but this is actually fairly typical looking results for most of the scenarios that we looked at. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about before we get into these big picture results is how are we characterizing sensor network coverage? Um, and for this, again, we're gonna ask two questions. The first question is, what fraction of these infections do we expect to be visible to the human sentinel network? Well, that's gonna be the product of three things. It's how many individuals are participating in the human sentinel network, right? What fraction of your population is participating? Um, what fraction of, of infections would result in an alert? How good is your wearable sensor? How good is your alerting algorithm? If it's only catching 50% of cases, that's gonna affect how many cases you see in the network. And then the final one is uh, the test fraction. Um, so how many of those individuals who receive alerts go and get that DOD approved test? 
Um, so you take the product of all these three, this instrument alert test, and we call that IET. And that's how we characterize coverage. You can do an analogous thing without the test part of it. And that's looking again at that non-specific signal, right? When, when you know something is going on. Um, so what fraction of, of cases are visible just to that first layer, that alerting layer? What we have found is that the same system performance can be achieved by many different combinations of values. So if you have a lot of people instrumented, you can, you can get away with poor algorithm performance. Um, if you're testing a lot of your people, you can get away with not having as many people enrolled in the program. Um, so you, know, you can use uh, one variable to sort of compensate for another. So in the results that follow, um, for each release mass, we would aggregate results um, based by which, which decile or which centile of IA or IAT they're in. Um, so now we get to kind of big picture results. Uh, I will draw your attention first to the fact that this uh, x-axis, this is nonlinear. So the first 10, um, you know, kind of slices there um, are, are single digits. Uh, percentiles, and then we get into the deciles. Um, and the different colors are the different release masses. Each of these dots is a mean, and the, the bars are standard deviation. And what we see is that the human sentinel network, um, and again, this is the difference in time between how long it takes current public health practice to pick up on something, you know, to pick up that first case versus for the human sentinel network to pick up that first case. Um, and we find that the human sentinel network outperforms public health by about one day. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, our medical ascertainment timing assumptions within the model uh, were aggressive. We worked with the SMEs to say, well, we're gonna assume that the, that the ER doctors in New York City are really on the ball and they're gonna recognize anthrax right away. And people are gonna feel so poorly that they're gonna go straight to the ER. Um, we were more conservative in our estimates of the human sentinel network. We wanted to be really careful about not biasing the model in our favor. Um, but we do think that this means that the human sentinel network may actually be a bit better than is shown. Um, what we see is that for very low coverage, very low IAT um, you know, percentage, uh, you get highly variable results. And that makes sense. You're picking up a very small fraction of the cases, so you're going to have a lot of variance. Um, but by the time you're in the mid-single digits, um, you, you've pretty well settled on, on you know, as much performance as, as you're going to get. Um, we do see that you know, the smallest release masses, those are the blue ones. You can see that they do tend to be lower. But the system is still performant here. Um, we haven't explored the lower limits. How small a release uh, could we detect? I'm going to skip over the, uh, the suspicious alert metric results because uh, they are incredibly uniform. It's about 12 hours after the release. You see so many alerts coming into the system um, that you would say, yeah, there's something going on. But what I want to talk about here are alerts by census tract. And this is sort of getting into different signatures in the, in the signals. Um, so this figure shows 16 different census tracts. The x-axis for each of these sub-figures uh, is time. This is days post-release. Um, and then the y-axis is the number of alerts that are shown in that census tract. Um, and you can see that some census tracts are much more affected than others. Um, this kind of information could help to determine the release location. It could help to estimate the impacted population. Um, and potentially, you could even use this kind of thing to distinguish the patterns of alerts that you see for um, you know, bioterror bio attacks from the kind of patterns that you see for a naturally occurring outbreak, um, you know, like, a, like a, a COVID hotspot or something. Um, the big uh, caveat here is that this figure here, this is all based on daytime locations. This is based on where people were at the time they were exposed. That's not where they're likely to be when their alert goes off. Um, so we you know, want to take on as future work 
how do we track movement? Um, and there is, you know, mobility data out there to help you do this. How do you track movement of the population um, so you can see how this signal would start to smear out um, over time? Thank you. Um, so we did some regressions um, and, and uh, to look at the relationship between the input parameters and performance metrics. Again, we didn't look at the suspicious alert metrics because there's very little variation there. Um, uh, and what we see here is that we can see the variables with the largest impact. And so the sensor density, that's the fraction of the population that's instrumented, the test fraction and their interaction dominate. We didn't actually look at this for IAT. Again, that's, that's something we'd like to do. Um, but you know, those, are, those are kind of the key metrics. Um, we did a regression um, for, again, that first detect metric against IAT. And you can see exactly the same thing here, right? That um, once you get to about 10%, um, uh, you know, you're really in, in the diminishing returns region. Um, we do see some slight differences if you say we want to detect two cases or three or four, but it's all broadly very similar. So to summarize, I hope I've shown you some pretty cool end, -to end modeling and analysis that captures the effects on such a system of the plume dispersion of the human sentinel network features. Um, you know, we found that we, we think such a network would provide about a one day detection lead time compared to current practices uh, for most of the scenarios in the study, a little bit more if you account for that non-specific signal. Um, the IAT values, you know, the performant um, range is between five and 15% of the of the individuals um, covered by the system. Um, so that, that's where you get consistent performance without falling into the region of diminishing returns. And exactly what that looked like in practice, whether you, you know increasing your instrumentation traction um, or increasing your test traction would depend on external constraints. How good are your sensor and your algorithm, for example? Um, and then the next step, so that we're looking to extend this model beyond event detection to simulation of, of morbidity and mortality at the population level. So uh, thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Yes. So is the instrumentation fraction in your model a concept with respect to geography or to location? It, it is this, uh, it's, not, it's not quite constant, um, but it's a uniform random uh, distribution, yes. So I, I guess my question is, do you have a sense of what, um, so for example, you can imagine that the, the desire to wear a watch might be dependent on you know, socioeconomic factors or demographics, which in turn could be embedded into the, you know, the model. Do you have a sense of how sensitive your results are to the distribution of the sensors? Um, that's something we have looked at and thought about a little bit, um, and not just with re regards to socioeconomic factors, but some populations are going to be at, at you know, higher risk than others. Um, um, yeah, that kind of, um, you know, uh, targeted or non-uniform sensor distribution, that's definitely of interest, and that is definitely something uh, that, you know, the sponsor wants to kind of game out before you try putting, putting this into practice, because you don't want to miss, you know, that the, you don't have enough coverage in this area, or you don't have enough coverage in this subpopulation. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> Um, so in terms of thinking about practically rolling this out in the instrumentation, is this is the idea that this would be some app that someone would add to something like a smartwatch that they already own, or is this a separate device that people would have to buy into wearing? Um, so, so some of those ConOps questions are not really ironed out. Both of those would be, you know, are, are options that we're looking at, right? A sort of bring your own device. Um, or, you know, would it have to be a particular device? All of the work, you know, that, that flu challenge study that I, that I refer to and the other studies sort of looking at this kind of concept, they are all using COTS devices. They use a Garmin watch, they use an Apple smartwatch, they use this Aura ring, which is another sort of, you know, wearable sensor device. Um, so there are a lot of devices out there, but this wouldn't have to be, for example, a, a specific, um, you know, custom device. 
Yes. I'm wondering, this is kind of a two part question. Did you look at the variation that was due to spatial um, dispersion versus non spatial and kind of comma, or would that even be appropriate in this type of study because you're um, kind of already looking at the spatial dispersion? I'm, I'm sorry, non spatial dispersion of, of the anthrax spores or? Yes. The kind of the variation of spatial versus non spatial was that part of it? Uh, that is not something we we looked at. No, it was it was just based on where an individual was, you know, at the time of the release, and then and then you know how much uh, how many spores they inhaled. Are you saying in the metric as opposed to like first like a time based measure of effectiveness or response a time and space like a multivariate okay I would, yeah i was thinking more about like i know in epidemiology sometimes they'll split the variation into what's based on the spatial variation versus non-spatial variation and i was just curious if that was part of it but i wasn't sure if that applied here yeah i think it doesn't apply because as as joe said because of the specific metrics that we're looking at right we're looking for that first detection um you know there's not a lot of anthrax right usually um, in major metropolitan areas. So if you get, you know, one or two or three anthrax cases, inhalation anthrax specifically, um, you know, you um, any any further, uh, you know, exploration of, of, you know, temporal variation there could be useful for characterization. Um, but our metric was was detection, the outbreak detection. I see. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thank Let's you so thank much. Thank our speaker again.